Hello, welcome to the Dental Equipment Repair Channel. I'm Jason, and uh, today I would like to continue our discussion on uh, some of the foundations of dental equipment repair. Last time we went ahead and uh, talked a little bit about technical curiosity as being a foundation of dental equipment repair. And today I'd like to talk about just the overall concept of troubleshooting. Now, troubleshooting is a uh, troubleshooting is the process of taking and uh, reading a set of information that's presented to you through a piece of equipment. Now, this equipment can't talk, but it's talking. Um, there are um, many ways to determine to basically receive information from a piece of equipment. And uh, those are through your senses, through sight, smell, um, feel, um, and probably not uh, touch or taste. <laughs> probably not taste, don't taste it, don't lick it. Um, but, and also hearing. So those four senses of sight, smell, touch, and hearing, those are um, four senses that you can use to understand what's happening with a piece of equipment. And the senses you're, you know, hearing, um, you might hear a relay clicking. Um, sight, you might see that something looks burned. Um, a touch, you might feel that something's hot or something's uh, cool when it should be warm. And then also, um, sight, touch, hearing, and then, uh, and then, uh, smell, smell. You might smell something like a burning. So uh, these are the ways that you would gather information. Now, troubleshooting is taking these clues and then being able to actually understand how the clues are pertinent to the piece of equipment that you're working on. Now, foundational to troubleshooting is basically taking a piece of equipment and taking this equipment and actually understanding um, understanding the equipment as a system, as an overall system. Um, it's like a, a system, say like a light on a lamp on your desk. Okay, you have the lamp. And the lamp, you go to turn it on, and it might not turn on. But if all you see is a lamp, you're going to be extremely limited. So understanding the lamp as a system, if we were to go and basically work from the lamp um, to where the uh, power originates. So the lamp itself is the bulb. Okay, you have the bulb, then you have the socket, then you have the wiring inside the lamp, then you have the power switch. Then you have the power cord that goes into a power plug. Then the power plug plugs into a maybe a uh, power strip. The power strip then goes ahead and again goes through another cord. Then the cord goes into another plug, which goes into a receptacle in your wall. Then the receptacle in your wall goes through wiring inside the wall, possibly through a ground fault circuit interrupter if it's in a wet location. Then from that GFCI, it might go through another set of wiring. And then finally, that would end up at a circuit breaker panel where there's a circuit breaker. And as you can see, that was like 10 things. But if your light doesn't turn on, if all you know how to do or all you understand is to change a light bulb, you're basically, there's 10, there's nine other things that it could have been. And if it's not that light bulb and you're not lucky, then you're not going to solve your problem. Now, understanding this scenario in a troubleshooting sense because i believe we've all turned on lights we all have this in our house and i believe we can all uh, kind of understand how this works now the foundation of troubleshooting is essentially again we're going to take 
something that we're troubleshooting and, and kind of stretch it out into a long line with a series of points. Okay. And this, what we need to do is basically we're going to do what's called the trouble, the half method. Now the half method is that when you're troubleshooting, you're going to take the very first part, which is going to be your circuit breaker. Okay. And maybe even building power, I guess. I don't know. If the, all the lights are out, then maybe that's your answer, right? But we're going to say a circuit breaker because that's typically where the first place is. And then the light bulb, which is the last working thing. So in, in that, um, in that, uh, ser in that series circuit, okay, it's a series circuit. We're going to go ahead and cut it straight in half in the middle. Now, I don't mean get out your scissors. What I mean is we're going to actually try to harvest information at the very center. Now, the information um, might be, okay, roughly in the center is going to be our power strip, okay? The information we might harvest is, okay, most power strips have a switch on them. Is the switch visibly, right, with their eyes, visibly turned to the on position? If it's turned to the on position, is the light on? Most of them have a lit switch. So if it's turned on and the light's on, then we know that the problem exists, okay, because we took a measurement right in the hat and in the middle. The problem exists between your, your power strip, okay, and the light itself. So now um, we've basically cut um, the circuit in half, and we've identified that all the wiring in your walls is good and your power strip is good. Now, say the light wasn't on on the power strip. The switch was on, the light wasn't on, and it was kind of clear that there was not power coming to the strip. What's an actionable step we could take? Um, we could walk over to the circuit breaker panel and see if there's any breakers that are tripped. Um, because we know that the problem is between the power strip and the wall and the breaker, we can go and that's an easy thing. We might even go and try plug something else in to that outlet that the circuit breaker or the, the power strip is plugged into to see if it turns on. So um, I'll segue into this. When you're taking, when you're trying to cut the circuit in half and look for things, you're trying to do steps that aren't going to take um, a lot of time or a lot of tools. You don't want to use a lot of time and you don't want to use a lot of tools when you're initially troubleshooting something. You're trying to isolate specifically where the problem is, but you're trying to do it as quickly as possible because the process of troubleshooting, um, the first stages are really just localizing where the problem is. Now, the problem might jump out at you, but essentially we're just trying to figure out with 10 points measuring in the middle is the problem, you know, this way or that way. Um, because if you can just figure out a direction, now you have a place to focus your energy. Because if you're trying to just look at 10 things and you're trying to understand 10 things, that's not really going to get you there. So um, we want to check things that are going to be easy in the beginning. And we also want to do things that are within our skill level. I am in no way asking you to take a tool and take something apart that's dangerous, like 120 volts where, or 2, 220, wherever you're, you're living, 240. Um, do not do anything that's going to put yourself in danger um, or, or you know, tr through troubleshooting. Be careful. Um, something is broken, and that could mean something's dangerous. So um, use your best judgment with this. I should have said that in the beginning, but so when you're troubleshooting again, we're trying to establish, we're trying to understand what are all the places in the circuit, right? We're we're making a series circuit, and then we're we're basically cutting it in half. And so for um, our idea, well, like with the light bulb, um, the the lamp, um, if we've determined that you know we walk back and the circuit breaker is tripped. We go ahead and reset it, and now the light will turn on. So it could be as quick as that. You know, you you look, hey, I need to go here, and you could have your light fixed within five minutes. Um, now, there are times when you're troubleshooting where it's just easiest, okay, to, um, it's easiest to look at the most obvious thing based on experience. Um, and that's something I'll, I'll just pause right here, experience. 
as you have experience repairing equipment or scenarios, fixing things, you're going to begin to see patterns. Trust those patterns. They're going to make you a better troubleshooter. If it last time it was um, the light bulb, you know, it's possible that this time it was a light bulb too. Um, if you take that light, take it and you kind of like jiggle it and you see the filament in there, you don't need to waste your time trying to do anything else. Um, you know, and that's where using your eyes, if you use your vision and you're able to know what you're looking for, okay, that can make you quicker. Everything doesn't have to turn into a big long process, but if it's not a light bulb, the thing that's going to set you apart, the thing that is going to really benefit you, the reason you're listening to this is because by cutting the circuit in half, you now have a next set of steps, okay, if that thing that it usually was isn't it. Because troubleshooting is required if you're going to produce a result that's more than just average. Average person change the light bulb. Average person calls somebody else to pay them to come fix it for them. If you want to be above average in these ways, then this is what you're going to do. Now, here's an experiment for you. Okay, this is um, my favorite thing to uh, way to teach this. Okay, for troubleshooting practice and the half method, um, the what you're going to do is we're going to go ahead and we're going to pick a um, we're going to pick a, a letter out of the alphabet. Now there's what, 26 letters in the alphabet, and the alphabet um, is a great uh, way to trouble is a great example of troubleshooting. Pick a letter that's broken. So, uh, for instance, we're going to say, like, why don't we say, like, the letter C is broken? So in five steps or less, I'm going to show you how we're going to go ahead and troubleshoot a broken letter C. So if you have it, our signal at A and you don't have it at Z, then what we're going to do is we're going to go, like, to the middle of the alphabet, which based on my memory, because this is I'm just spontaneous and prompt to training right now. Um, I think it's like N or O or M or something, right? It's right in the middle. Okay. We're going to take a measurement there. Now remember, okay, we're walking through this in our, you know, verbally here, um, our problems at C, right? So are we going to have a measurement at, you know, at O? Like we're just going to pick a spot in the middle and measure. At, do we have it at O? No, because it stopped at C. So then what we're going to do is we're going to say we don't have it, which means it's going to be towards A. So now between A and O, we're going to go and pick a middle letter, which is probably going to be what? Like something like G or something. Then we're going to go and measure a G because that's in the middle of the origin A and the last point we measured, which is O. Now we're not a G. Are we going to get it? No, we're not going to get it. So the um, we're, we know that it's between G and A. Then we're going to go in between G and A, which is something like what? Like D. Okay, so we're going to take a measurement of D. Well, C is broken. Are we going to get it at D? No, we're not. So how many measurements have we done so far? We did a measurement at like N, G, D. No, no, no. Okay, three measurements. Now we're going to go ahead and say, okay, we're getting really close. The problem is somewhere between A and D. So now we're just going to pick because A and D, it's either going to, it's going to be C, right? Something like C um, or B. So if you pick B, all right, then you're going to have your measurement, which you're going to know that you have it at B, you don't have it at D, and then that's going to put you to C, which is five guesses. Now, say you guess right, okay, and say instead of B, you pick C, then you picked it, and now you just guessed it in four guesses. So basically, a 26-letter alphabet, we just troubleshot it in between four and five steps. Now, I've done this exercise before where I've actually got lucky and guessed the right letter on the very first guess. You can try this with a friend. You just pick the letter and you basically let them not know. And then basically just an A to Z, keep cutting it in half and just working the direction. And I think what you're going to see is it's, it's like magic. And this magic is something that you can apply as your technical knowledge of dental equipment grows and other equipment. You can go ahead and apply this knowledge to troubleshooting. So again, 
The things we covered today is the importance of troubleshooting, becoming aware of what a, uh, a system is, um, like thinking in terms of systems, and also thinking in terms of a circuit, um, isolating the area that the problem is and not getting distracted by symptoms, and then finally, our process for actually troubleshooting, which is called the half method. And um, so go ahead and let me know what you think about this. Um, this is not uh, meant to be super revolutionary um, to somebody who's been repairing equipment for a long time. But this is meant to be foundational for somebody who's just getting into this. So, because I believe in order to be a truly exceptional repair technician, you need to be a truly exceptional troubleshooter. And if you can become a good troubleshooter, um, all you have to do is build hand skills to match what you know inside your mind. And that is going to carry you, um, you know, very, very far. Because then all you're doing is filling in details of the specifics of what your equipment is that you're working on. So I appreciate you taking the time to uh, join me for this little talk. And again, if there's anything else you'd like to talk about, uh, let me know. And I hope um, you have a great day. Thank you.